Thank you very much indeed, and thank you for that introduction. When I hear all of that, I look forward to hearing myself. <laughs> uh, can I first of all say, uh, I'm very glad to be speaking at this forum this morning, and I'm delighted to be here for three reasons. <coughs> One is, I was very delighted to see the word Commonwealth in part of your uh, title of the conference, because I am a Commonwealth person, deeply committed to the Commonwealth, and as Her Majesty the Queen described it as the original World Wide Web. And of course, I do endorse its purpose, which is to promote understanding, human rights, democracy, and celebrate cultural diversity. And of course, I have been involved informally and formally for years and of course, more recently, both as chair and president of the Royal Commonwealth Society. My second reason for being, uh, being pleased to be here is because I believe that more than ever in today's world, we need to develop understanding and build trust between nations for common good of our globalized world. Hence, my involvement with the British Council an organization which has been devoted to cultural relations over the last 80 years. Three, of course, I think is an opportunity to hear and share different views on cultural diplomacy, cultural relations, and nation branding in, uh, in the Commonwealth. But I would like to begin by saying a few words about these terms. I do not wish to be pedantic, but I think terminology to some extent is quite important because it determines people's understanding, the attitudes and actions that actually follow. And uh, Mr. Donfried said he was intrigued by my title because I thought I was playing around with those words. So I want to dwell a little bit on what I see. And with respect to my hosts, I have to say for me personally, Cultural diplomacy has rather an old-fashioned ring, and of course, these are you know, in, 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 in different contexts. For me, it sort of conjures up an image of formal presentation of cultural activity, and that's why I like the word cultural relations, a term which we use to describe the work of the British Council, because I see that cultural relations in the modern world is about building relations, building understanding and trust through interaction between people of different backgrounds and cultures. And it is about building meaningful long-term relationships between individuals. And cultural relations is the way in which nations express themselves in the wider world by means of arts, language, education. And it is about how they engage with others explain themselves and converse with each, others, each other and build trust. Now, just a few words about the term nation branding, an expression coined by Simon Arnold, who has gone to great lengths to explain that it does not refer to a simple marketing exercise. We cannot market nations in the way we can market commodities. And it is not a question of sticking a label on something and then selling it. It comes rather from a reality about a nation. It is a way of focusing attention on the admirable and positive features of a country's cultural life and its ways of doing things. It is perhaps the first step towards a fully fledged cultural relations policy, but it is the first step. And we have to go beyond a kind of a simplistic understanding of nation branding. Uh, the British Council recently published a book called As Others See It, and that very well sets out for me uh, what we mean, because what this report illustrates is, not, is, is the one thing that overwhelmingly makes a nation attractive to others, is its enduring appeal in its culture and its values, and how these are lived, transmitted, and imbued in all its activities and way of life. The British Council, with, uh, with a presence in over 100 countries, is particularly focused on this kind of relationship building. It is committed to working with people and within countries for the long term. Even the most difficult conditions 
as building relationships and trust does not happen overnight. It was the British Council's lasting presence in countries of former Eastern Bloc that proved so important 25 years ago. For example, in staying in places such as Romania and Poland through the tough times meant that we were able to play a productive role in supporting the transformation of these countries. The other example which I'm really fond of is the British Council's schools in Madrid. This school was opened in 1940s during the years of dictatorship, offering bilingual and bicultural education and being quite explicit about its intention to inculcate values of freedom, honesty, integrity, and creativity. So today that school is the most popular school. I visited it earlier this year and to see children of all different backgrounds working in a bicultural, bilingual environment and the contribution that is beginning to make. So it's the long-term relationship. So it is not a question of overtly exporting or promoting the values, but rather sharing them indirectly by keeping conversations going, by keeping doors open to different views and beliefs and engaging with people and not just governments. The essence of cultural relations is connecting with people. And for me, the essence is reciprocity and longevity. Because in the modern world, it's the reciprocal relationships which are really very, very important. And British Council's eight years experience and the way Council has evolved to respond to the changing world tells me that this is a long game. More than ever about building relationships through cultural activity, exchange, and education, and it has to be reciprocal. The other example I have is Burma or Myanmar. British Council Library in Rangoon remained open during the long years of country's international isolation, providing the people of Burma with a window to the world. Today, with the change in Burma's leadership and the signs of political thought, we are working closely with the administration to support development of a vibrant civil society, enable the reform of education system, and of course, the security of law, because uh, a security, uh, 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 the reform of the security sector, because the rule of law is seen as very important basis of any democracy. So hyperconnectivity, though an old world, still expresses the biggest truth about today's world. There is a qualitative change in the way people connect. New technology and social media has, of course, transformed interactions, but not always for the positive, but we have to make sure that there's a responsible use of these. Now, so far, I have been talking about what I call bicultural, bilateral cultural relations. But the Commonwealth has been and continues to be a forum for multilateral cultural relations. Its role is to build on the common issues such as language, common law and political systems, common heritage, and promote understanding, diversity, human rights, and democratic practices. Its mainstay is reciprocity, conversational connections, and its greatest strength is that it is a voluntary associ association and all of its members are equal. It is, as I said earlier, a people's commonwealth. Because when it was founded, it's not just a question of governments, it's the people's commonwealth. And its greatest events are those which celebrate diversity and cultural activity. The Commonwealth Day, when different faiths come together, or the Commonwealth Games, as we saw in Glasgow earlier this year, when thousands of competitors from all over Commonwealth take part in friendly games. So the identity of the nation branding is actually through the Commonwealth. So I think it is where the multilateral cultural relations take place. And aspirations to be part of the Commonwealth is actually there. Now, other activities which take place around these high-profile activities reinforce the ties and connections. Now, British Council, for example, not only supports bilateral links with individual members, but works across the Commonwealth on initiatives such as Commonwealth Class, which we did with the BBC, and we brought together schools and children from all over the Commonwealth 
to encourage them to make the most of their shared history and forge long-term links. And that's where the new technology was phenomenally important. And some 100,000 schools are involved in British Council's culture program at the Glasgow Commonwealth Games. And what around this Commonwealth Games, there were other activities of music, poetry, dance. So you could see the opportunity was used to make sure how people came together through cultural activity. For me, but the most poignant element was a major art exhibition, which took the, the title from the work by an Indian artist called Shilpa Gupta. It was called, Where Do I End? Where Do I End and You Begin? And this is a real sense, the question of all the work of connecting, which, which seeks to answer. Commonwealth through multi, multilateral cultural relations provides a platform for small, medium, large countries to interact on equal basis. And their brand is the Commonwealth and what it, is, what it aspires to be. It has an enormous potential to promote positive good for the global change. And I think we haven't yet tapped all its potential. And it has to be realized the fact that those with no formal connection with the Commonwealth want to join is a testimony to the enduring power and appeal of the Commonwealth. As you know, Rwanda's joined. I mean, people who had no connection are wanting to join the Commonwealth. Networks of communications in the 21st century are very different. And technology, as I said, is very powerful. Tool for exerting influence. And the key to such influence will increasingly be the flows of cultural exchange. Attraction rather than coercion implies more democratic modes of communication. And we're living in a moment of great opportunity. And I think the salience of cultural relations, or what some people call soft power, is increasing. And as it has never been easier to transmit ideas. And as Simon Arnold said, given that the biggest threats to the world peace are ideological in nature, it seems surprising that the lessons of the Cold War appear not to have been learned. But where culture is the problem, culture is the only solution. That is right. And it means that we all have a huge responsibility to ensure that good ideas win in the end. And the cultural relations in my book is a very forceful mode through which we can do that. Thank you for listening.